so Bitcoin is universal, global, fun, fungible, standardized property, and it's digital. You have $10 million, you live in Africa. You can buy anything in Africa for $10 million, any company, any building, any land, any set of commodities, any bonds, but the catch is you have to keep it there for 100 years. Right. Or you can buy Bitcoin. What would you buy in Africa that you would prefer to owning global digital property that you could take with you? And the answer is nothing. And I put you back into Africa and I said, okay, now you can't buy Bitcoin. Now I can buy the best hotel I can find in Nigeria. Hold that for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. Good luck with that. But there's nobody in their right mind would say that investment seems as, as high quality as buying you know, the best portfolio of stocks and holding them in the Upper East Side of New York City. I think that, uh, that Bitcoin adoption has been held back by misunderstanding of its true nature because the industry has been collectively and colloquially called the cryptocurrency industry. So people's immediate reaction is it must therefore be a currency and a currency is a medium of exchange and they think of the euro and the dollar and the yen and the shekel and the whatever. And, yep. and it, they think it's a currency and their immediate reaction is, well, I, I know it's not legal tender, so it's tax inefficient to trade it. And I know it's not my government's favorite currency. And so it must be against the government and it seems silly and it's not stable and it's volatile and nothing's priced in it. So I, therefore I think it's stupid or it's threatening. In a recent interview at Bitcoin Prague with Efrat Fenigson, Michael Saylor articulated the notion that Bitcoin represents a form of digital money comparable to the strong money that gold once was. He further elucidated that Bitcoin is often termed digital property due to its distinctive attributes and operation within the digital space. Bitcoin's ability to be transferred seamlessly across the globe mirrors the transfer of ownership in physical property. This process, however, is instantaneous and requires no intermediaries, highlighting Bitcoin's efficiency and convenience. Drawing parallels to real estate and precious metals, Saylor explained how people traditionally invest in these assets to hedge against inflation. In a similar vein, Bitcoin is perceived as a store of value. Its finite supply and decentralized structure make it a compelling choice for those looking to preserve wealth in the digital age. As we bring you clips from the interview, take a moment to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more video like this. You can join the conversation by dropping your thoughts, comments, and observations in the comments section below. Everything you do helps with YouTube algorithm and immensely contributes to the channel growth. Thanks and enjoy the video. Now, if you simply if you step back and ask more deeply, what is Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is digital money. What is money? Money could be a store of value, a medium exchange or a unit of account. Mm -hmm. But the aspect of money that's a medium of exchange is currency. And the aspect of money that's a store of value is capital. Mm -hmm more like property, but especially capital. Most people don't really think about a uh, form of money and capital because we haven't really had uh, a strong uh, money as capital since the gold standard. The closest thing would be when you could hold gold as your capital asset and then you used um, notes or, or paper currency that was pegged to gold or some other currency as a medium exchange. You think about Bitcoin as digital capital and you think about the dollar as currency. Once you understand that you see, well, currencies are medium exchanges and the thing you need in a medium exchange is it needs to be legal tender because you need to be able to transfer it tax free. And of course, the dollar is the world reserve currency, and then other countries will have their own currencies. They'll be the euro, the CNY, the peso, etc. 
Any country that's an effect, effective nation state will have their own currency, and when the nation state is failing after a war, it may dollarize. It may, you know, nation states will adopt the euro in lieu of their own currency when they can't support one, or they'll adopt the dollar, or they'll adopt CNY. Uh, and so there's like whatever 120 currencies, but there's 180 or more countries, right? So that's there's nothing exciting going on there right now, with the uh, with the exception that people are creating digital currency in the form of stable coins like mm -hmm. Tether or Circle, and in a country with a collapsing fiat currency like Argentina or like Turkey or Lebanon you would prefer the yep. digital currency stable coin because that dollar looks like a store of value to you, uh -huh. right? If you actually converted a million pesos to a million dollars 25 years ago, you now have a billion pesos. Mm -hmm. So it's perfectly fine as a capital asset and as a medium of exchange when your existing economy is collapsing. Mm -hmm. If your existing economy is not collapsing and you're in the European Union or the United States, or a country where the currency is pegged to the dollar. Mm -hmm. In that case, you can just use your local currency as a medium of exchange. And then the issue is what's your store of value? And if you talk to any wealthy person in any of those places, none of them will tell you the euro is the store of value. And they won't tell you the dollar is the store of value. Every rich person you meet is going to tell you that they own a portfolio of real estate or property assets or they own company stocks. If you understand Bitcoin is digital currency, your reaction is immediate and negative and ignorant and inflammatory. Um, if you simply turn the narrative and say, hey, it's digital property, you're going to buy it instead of buying a building. You know, uh, and, and that's a very simple thing. You know, it's like y you have $10 million, you live in Africa. You can buy anything in Africa for $10 million, any company, any building, any land, any set of commodities, any bonds. But the catch is you have to keep it there for 100 years. Right. Or you can buy Bitcoin. What would you buy in Africa that you would prefer to owning global digital property that you could take with you? And the answer is nothing. Of course. There's nothing you would buy, and there's no country you would buy it in. Nothing. You wouldn't buy a diversified portfolio of anything, right? And, and so that illustrates a point, and the point is Bitcoin is digital capital, it's global capital, and it conveys the same property rights to a business person or an individual in Africa, an individual with $100, a business person with a million dollars, a billionaire with a billion dollars. They all have the a government. They all have the same property right, the same opportunity as a billionaire in Manhattan, yep. as the king of England, as the royal family in Dubai. Now, if I took Bitcoin away from you, and I put you back into Africa and I said, okay, now you can't buy Bitcoin. Now I can buy the best hotel I can find in Nigeria. Hold that for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. Good luck with that. But there's nobody in their right mind would say that investment seems as, as high quality as buying, you know, the best portfolio of stocks and holding them in the Upper East Side of New York City. Mm -hmm. Right? Just not as good. Right? So... So Bitcoin is digital capital. It's global capital. It's, I, I would call it digital property because it's easier for people to get their head around the right. idea of property with the only caveat being if I buy a billion dollar building in London, um, it takes me a year to buy it. It takes me a year to sell it. I can't move it. I may be property taxed on it. But otherwise, it'll probably appreciate in value faster than the monetary inflation rate or at the rate of monetary inflation because it's scarce desirable mm -hmm. as long as people want to live in London mm -hmm. and do business in London. If I buy a billion dollars of Bitcoin while living in London, I can buy that with no transaction cost in a minute, well, a few hours probably. Uh, I can sell it in a few hours when I want, 24-7, mm -hmm. 365. I can move it to any jurisdiction 
and I can place it in the custody of any custodian, it is globally desirable by anybody with money anywhere in the world. Bitcoin is digital property, but it's got a lot of characteristics that are better than physical property. And it's kind of difficult to break up the building into a hundred pieces and then recombine them together next week. But Bitcoin is fungible, it's liquid, it's global, right? I can move it at high frequency. And you know, the building you bought in London, well, okay, you bought a billion dollar building. Can you buy a hundred can you buy ninety-nine more buildings that are equally valuable also in London? Can you do that this year? Well, they're not fungible, right? No. Right? Every building is different than every other sure. building. People will say, well, that building is on a, on the end of the street corner and this other building that looks exactly the same is only worth half as much. Right. And if I'm the mayor and I change the traffic pattern, I can devalue your building. Correct. You know? So, Bitcoin is universal, global, fun, fungible, standardized property, and it's digital. A computer can move it around, and that's why it holds such a global appeal to everybody on the planet, no matter, you know, you want to buy $20 worth of a building? Good luck with that. Yeah. You can buy $20 Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, you can work your way up to a million dollars of Bitcoin twenty in twenty dollar increments, and when you get to a million, it's it's not devalued. Try buying a building twenty dollars at a time. Yeah, it's not possible. Right? You, you're just not you're not going to buy a million dollar building twenty dollars at a time. So Bitcoin offers property rights and, and it offers this digital capital to eight billion people. At scale, they can buy with their weekly paycheck, and it, and it works whether or not you're working class, middle class, upper class, a pension fund, megacorp, little corp, nation state. Everybody has the same exact asset. They all have the same benefit. If you're a rich person and you live in Alabama and you buy... $27 million of property in Alabama, there's nothing anybody in Israel is doing to increase the value of your property in Alabama. That's right. There's nothing going on in Moscow or Dubai or Abu Dhabi or Singapore or London to increase the value of your property in Alabama. That's right. You're making a local investment. When you are that same person and you buy $27 million of Bitcoin in Alabama, there's a person in Singapore that comes up with an idea for a trade that's illegal in Alabama. Yep. That you couldn't do if you want to. That guy builds $10 million of equipment, borrows $10 billion worth of Bitcoin, does the trade, and triples the value of Bitcoin. And you triple your money because Thanks somebody somewhere else in the world yep. came up with an idea you didn't know about, you weren't capable of, and legally you couldn't have done. But it's that's the that power of being connected yeah. into the global economy. Right. And it works the other way. The guy in Singapore benefits from what's going on in Paris and London and Dubai and Abu Dhabi and what's going on here in Prague right now. Everybody's working for everyone in a network that's mutually beneficial to all participants. So there you have it. Michael Saylor's insightful discussion on what is Bitcoin. Michael describes Bitcoin as a form of global property that is non-fungible, liquid, and accessible to anyone. The smallest unit called a Satoshi represents 100 millionth of a Bitcoin, allowing everyone on the planet to participate and benefit. He further explains that Bitcoin serves as digital capital and property offering advantages to all 8 billion people. What are your thoughts on Michael's perspective about Bitcoin's potential to benefit the entire ecosystem? Hope you got some value from this video. Please share your comments and observations in the comment section below. Subscribe to our channel and give this video a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.